All Things Alice. This podcast will explore the cultural phenomenon of Alice in Wonderland as artistic landmark and global symbol of inspiration and imagination. I'm your host, Frank Bedore, the author of the Looking Glass Wars trilogy. Let's explore what is it about Alice? Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm very excited to have my next guest, Ed Dechter. He is a fantastic TV showrunner, screenwriter, director, novelist, and teacher at AFI. His feature credits include a movie I'm very familiar with, There's Something About Mary, the Santa Claus sequels 2 and 3, The Wild, and the Lizzie McGuire movie. And as a television showrunner and writer, he's executive produced both comedies and dramas, Chicago Sun, Odd Man Out, The Closer, Boy Meets World, which I believe ran for five years, In Plain Sight, The Client List, and most recently, Shadow Hunters. But currently, Ed is the executive producer and creator of Mercy Dogs for FX and Harlan Coben's Shelter for Amazon. But my favorite project he's working on is James Elroy's Beverly Hills Noir. I love that script. He's also written six novels for Simon & Schuster. But my favorite Ed Dechter credit is Best Friend, as in mine. I'm so delighted to chat with you, Ed. I know we do this almost every day, almost every week, but uh, let's talk about all things Alice. Looking forward to it. Okay, good. So, um, you know, it's been a minute since you and I met uh, at a Shakespeare class at UCLA. I think that was in 19... Maybe we shouldn't even talk about that date, right? That's not. (laughs) But I do remember the teacher was quite boring. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. (laughs) We used to... uh, commiserate uh, over a beer afterwards. And that is when you told me you were writing, I think it was your first script? No, not your first script. No, it wasn't the first one, but it was uh, a spec script that um, uh, my writing partner at the time, John, and I uh, decided to write to sort of uh, put out into the marketplace because that that was a, a, an era where spec scripts sold very well. Especially comedies, right? Yes. And, and, and it all started with Shane Black with Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon. And the movie we're talking about is There's Something About Mary. So uh, just tell me, I, I remember you, you read an article about, is that true that you read an article about somebody who hired a pr- private detective? No, or- I had heard a story that uh, a man who, um, uh, it just so happened he was gay, uh, had lost touch with the person growing up that made him feel comfortable about being gay and had lost, completely lost uh, touch. And this was sort of a more difficult pre-internet era where it wasn't, everybody wasn't on Facebook or something. And um, so he hired a private eye to find that person. Um, And uh, also uh, what we, my writing partner lived in an apartment building that looked out onto the the bedrooms of all these condos about a building or two over. And there used to be a, and it, it sounds especially creepy now in the Me Too era, but <laughs> there used to be this woman who would get dressed, but would never put down the blinds. And, you know, we were young guys, unmarried, and we would glance over there and um, it, we would wonder, what if this private eye was looking for her and then would lie to the person who hired them and says, no, I didn't find her. And then now that he has tailed her and sort of stalked her, he would know yeah. everything about her. So he'd be able to talk to her very easily and we'd know all this info. And so that's where the idea was born. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's it's been 25 years. This summer will be the anniversary and you bring up the Me Too movement. So I wonder, do you think there's something about Mary could be made today, given some of the the dialogue that uh, Matt Matt um, Dylan said in particular about you know working with retards and <laughs> there, there's not a chance that it would be made today. There's not a chance, but um, it's kind of great that it uh, came together in that way because it, it found exactly the right directors because those guys are uh, really gregarious, but they're, uh, completely not mean spirited. They're right. completely warm and 
like your best Irish friends that you've ever had or your best Irish brothers that you ever had. And so therefore they didn't infuse it with any kind of creepiness. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the, um, the, the, the marriage between your script and the uh, Farrelly brothers script, because I remember reading it, um, back when we were in that class, that Shakespeare class. And as I remember, Ted was the detective and the lead. Is that right? Yes. It, it, the, we, it was sort of the reverse when it first started because we, we were saying who would be the most difficult person for Mary to accept would be the detective that, that found out all this information on her. So, But the Farrelly's flipped it, made Ted uh, the original guy looking for her. And, uh, and that, uh, that was a big change that they made. But they, interestingly enough, they kept the exact flow of all the things that happened after that. So, but they had had an idea um, that they were calling, I think at the time, the loser about this character, Ted, and all those crazy things that happened to him. And it was going to be a road picture. So they put that, uh, the things that happened to him going down to see Mary, where he meets the guy with the seven-minute abs... And all the, all those uh, things and the rest stop uh, and all of that stuff, he they they took from um, this or this idea that they had and wove it into the the their version of Mary. But I remember you had some really great. I mean, to your point, you had some really great set pieces. Um, also, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. But I remember a couple of lines where Ted was talking about, um, he was trying to pick up, you know, as the detective, we, we see him try and pick up a girl and the woman says, Hey, uh, you know, you're not my type. And he says, well, what's your type? Very athletic. And he's like, Oh, so you're not into, um, Olympic athletes. And she said, well, what kind of Olympic athlete are you? And she goes, Paul Volter. He said, Paul Volter. Yeah. And I remember laughing about that. And, um, and then I remember it, because it was flipped and Ted was a detective and I think Ray was what became Healy, um, he was his best friend and he wanted to find this girl and he said, well, I'll do it for you. He goes, how much do you charge? And he said, $800. And then a friend, another friend said, no, you charge 400. And then he did a whole thing with the math. Well, it's 800 for two days or 400 for four days. Right. And I remember that was very funny. And, um, and then the scene with the, um, with the girlfriend talking about, that's verbatim. Yes. That's in the script verbatim. And also the architect and... The architect was in there verbatim. That was hilarious. Um, so I remember there were those big, big... Set and the pieces. golf... The golf, and um, I'm very proud to have taught um, uh, Cameron Diaz her golf swing. Um, and, and by the way, I, I think in our intro, I said you were a um, sometimes golfer. So uh, we have a long history of uh, playing golf. Mm -hmm. That's how our friendship really, we really bonded. Mm -hmm. But um, So the even today, you think with that script, I mean, I mean, because comedy, what that, what Mary did was it pushed the envelope into the, you know, I, I do not like this gross out comedy. That's how it was, you know, it was framed because some of those big gags. But ultimately, do you think of it as it has, it has big set pieces, it's got romantic comedy, it's got gags. Um, and yeah, some, I suppose, are sort of gross out. but I, I, I never liked that term either. I, I just think that the Farrelly's made a really funny movie. And, uh, and, and I just think it was R-rated, so they called it that. But I don't think you could make The Hangover today. I don't think you could make Wedding Planner, Wedding uh, Crashers. And uh, there's a whole bunch of movies I don't think you could make. Right. And I think that's probably why we haven't seen any, I mean, any comedies out there for a while that push the envelope. So I don't know where the next, what the next wave will be, but it was fun to be on the something about Mary wave. Yes, absolutely. But even in stand up now, you see people framing things completely differently. Like they'll say, this is completely unacceptable to say, but have you noticed, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll frame things like that, almost taking the criticism uh, or the, 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 the criticism that they would get into into their stand-up. Right, yeah. I, um, 
I, uh, I, I still come back to um, the one, the title. There's something about Mary. I cannot imagine a different name, even though there was some consideration for there's something about Sarah. Yeah. I, I, for some reason, the Farrelly's called us up one day and said, we're thinking of changing it to something about Sarah. I said, fine. I mean, it, we, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the famous movie that it is now. So we, we said, fine. Yeah. And, and, I, and I saw the, on, the, on the casting director's list something about Sarah. And, uh, and it, it, it took me out of it for a minute. Like, what are we doing? I mean, and, and now you think about, well, first of all, you can't imagine anybody but Cameron Diaz, right? Um, because she was just so perfect. But there were some other um, suggestions that that you uh, put forward. One of which was uh, Julia Roberts, which that makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, I mean, th- but that was early Julia Roberts. That was like closer to the time she did Mystic Pizza. Really? Was it that? Was it that twenty five years ago? Did when did she do um, Pretty Woman? Pretty Woman. Yeah, but I mean, it, it was it was around. It was early, before she became the biggest star in the world at that time. Elle McPherson. Elle McPherson. <laughs> well, she was she was at the top of her form as a model. Yes. So, uh, you know, why not put her in there? Uh, H- Haley Berry. Yes. Um, that would have been interesting. Been great. Uma Thurman. She Uma was Thurman. Uh, she was on the list. Elizabeth Hurley. You know, she she would not have I I, I there's nothing funny about her uh, Elizabeth Hurley, but she had been in that movie where she played the devil or something like that, right? I mean, uh, I forget what that oh. movie was. So she, there, she was, she, she was, yeah, she was kind of happening then. Um, uh, Karma Electra. God, I don't. Yeah, it's it's hard to imagine that. <laughs> yeah, thing. or Jodie Foster. Well, yeah, hard to imagine. It, 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 we. <laughs> but change. that's but that's the fun of you know you put these lists together and yeah. you just don't know because you're looking for chemistry like I think you had um, Nicholas Cage as the detective he would have been crazy wild as don't you think I think he would have been great I think he would have been fantastic yeah as well. I mean I, Matt Dillon was fantastic but I I think Nicholas Cage as a as a sort of berserk uh, private I, but, I think that would have been but, amazing but, but balance that out with uh, the George Clooney was on the list as well yeah there you <laughs> go yeah. yeah so um, or uh, John Bon Jovi <laughs> it's like so you could have a rock star yeah yeah as uh, it's it's endless when you're when you're dreaming when you're putting a putting a movie together I think we got really lucky with uh, with the casting um, everybody wanted. Cameron, that was a slam dunk. And then... Well, no, if you recall, if you recall, uh, some of the Fosk executives did not think that Cameron was their first choice at all. Well, that's, yes, yeah, separate. Uh, I was taking the studio. If we talk from the studio, they didn't want anybody. Anybody. They didn't want um, Ben. They didn't want Ben. They didn't want Matt Dillon. They didn't want Cameron at first. We couldn't figure out who they wanted. Right. Um, because she had done, Cameron had done that movie. The Mask. No, that was a big hit, but she had done for Fox Life Less Ordinary, uh-huh. I think. Um, and I don't think that was a big hit. So they were worried. Uh, but we all, all the creatives, we all wanted her. And then it was building it from there. But then it became a chess game because if you remember, Owen Wilson was our first choice and they said yes, and Peter went to Owen Wilson and said, "Hey, we're gonna we're, we want you for this movie." And then the studio said no, and we we were like, "Well, what about Ben Stiller?" And they were like, "Well, nobody knows him from except on the East Coast, West Coast." Um, and we also said we want a Matt Dillon, and they said, "Well, you have to choose." Like what? And so we chose uh, Ben, and and then Cameron was seeing uh, Matt at the time. And that was the last piece, and that was like pulling out. That was really tough, uh, and they finally caved, and we got our cast. So, I remember talking to the studio executive and said, "Who's funny in this movie? Just tell me one person that's funny in your film." <laughs> but that all changed once they saw the the uh, the uh, the dailies. That's right. Peter and Bobby Farrelly are funny. That's for sure. Yeah, those guys are very funny. And they had a track record, and they're very charming, and they convinced the studio at the end of the day. And once they saw some of those scenes, I don't know about well, you. they didn't convince the studio by the end of the day, meaning before they shot, uh, they were supposed to have taken out everything in the script that we now recognize as funny, right? 
they the dog going on fire the of course uh, unharmed but uh the, the 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 hair gel the people singing in the trees i mean they were supposed to take out all of that and they kept saying yes yes we're taking it out and then they started shooting yeah well and then they they sent it and then eventually about halfway through tom uh tom rothman Sherrick. no tom, Roth- tom Sherrick was the hero tom Sherrick, who was the re- guy who released all the films at fox including star wars said, don't touch a thing. It's funny. But wait, wait, wait. But Tom Rothman was the executive who took over, and he's the one that came down to the set yep. and took you know credit for the whole movie. But he, when he took over, he had been working for Fox Searchlight, and he said, hey, I, I, I don't want to do... I think he coined it. I don't want to do a gross-out comedy. Right. And suddenly we're calling it a gross-out comedy. But to your point, the other Tom, he came in and said, I've seen the dailies as well. You know, don't touch it. Don't touch it. So, well, is that your, would you consider that your, well, that's your biggest movie hit for sure, right? Yeah, yeah. the the uh, Santa Claus movies did a lot of business. They did. They were big business, right? Yeah. And how did you, um, how did you enjoy transitioning to directing? Oh, well, I mean, it's, it's startling. You, you, when you grow up, you think, oh, a director really makes all the decisions and chooses everything. And it's really not true when you're a first-time director, unless you're doing an indie that you've helped get the financing for. And then you 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 have more of what uh, Marty right. Scorsese goes through, but with less budget. Right. And but uh, but when you're when you work for a studio and you do a first time movie, you get a lot of you know, tomorrow uh, there will be Gene Simmons from Kiss in the movie. And then you will say, well which part is he playing? He goes, whatever part you write tonight for him. Wow. Yeah, that kind of thing. Wow. Yeah, that does not happen in independent films. On the movie Wicked, to your point, I was producing uh, Wicked, and then shortly thereafter, Mary. And on Wicked, we had $2 million. Um, and so the director was able to make you know all the decisions in concert with, um, with what the whole production wanted. Um, and on Mary, once they left us alone, uh, the Farrelly brothers shot everything that they wanted, um, and because we were out of town. When you did your movie, were you shooting in town? No, I was in Austin, Texas, but still they, you know, one of the studio executives came down there. So they, 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 it, it, it's just different than you imagine it to be, um, you know, great in some ways. And then very difficult in other ways. Well, let me ask you the difference between now working in film and working in television as a showrunner, because, you know, in in film, it's usually the director who's at the helm, and in television, it's the showrunner. So what is... Well, it's the director at the helm when you've reached a point where you've done hit movies. Right, and, okay. And then you're, then you're really like the old-time directors that you think about. Like but, James Cameron. Yes, but if you're if you're doing your first studio movie, you're not as much in control as you think you are. But but when you run a show, you it's more like being an old time director because you hire the many directors that direct the episodes. You hire all the writers. You hire the uh, and of course you have to get approvals from the network. Uh, for, you hire the cinematographers and the art di- directors and the production designers. You hire all those people, but you don't. Unless you're like Shonda Rhimes, you don't just say this is who is shooting the movie or the or the television show. You get somebody. You you say this is a candidate I really like, and maybe the network has worked with them before, and they go, oh, absolutely, they're great. And then it's it's literally that long a discussion. But if sometimes you you have to have three candidates or something. So you it's a it's a collaboration, but you're leading the discussion about what we need. In terms of the each episode and who should be who the guest stars are, yeah. And, and a, a good uh, friend of mine said, um, the, a really good showrunner friend of mine said that uh, television, uh, that that movies are war and television is government. Mm. And so oh, that's you, a great analogy. Yeah. So you can go off and make war and shoot something and literally burn down a town and then go home. And have the insurance pay off the town and never go back there. But in television, you're returning places. If your show is working and you go on for many years, you're returning places many, many years. 
Um, because you do both comedy and drama, can we just take a step back to where the writing inspiration came from, um, to have a diverse, to be able to write in these multiple genres, whether it's drama or procedural or comedy? Um, and then you, I know, uh, you know, how, how, how did you find that voice? Well, um, it's, that, that's a really good question. And, uh, we, the, I teach this at the AFI, I teach at the AFI, the American Film Institute. And, uh, I always say, you got to find a part of yourself that connects with a project and you, th- different parts of yourself connect with different projects. So, uh, you know, I did that, uh, uh, I created that show shadow hunters on, um, uh, on freeform. And it, the, the, obviously, I, it's very tough to connect with vampires or or werewolves. But Again, I, another fantasy. That's fantasy. There's another genre, right? right? And and that connects to Alice very much, and we'll talk about that. But but uh, th- it, that one, um, uh, I really could connect to. There was a mother who didn't tell her daughter how special she was, much in the Harry Potter paradigm. And when she, but when she became 18, she started to come into some powers that really confused her and then in fact jeopardized her because she didn't know who she really was. And it's a classic paradigm in, um, in all of fantasy, but I, I could, uh, relate to a parent protecting their kids so much that they actually hurt them in certain ways because they didn't give them tools to survive on their own. And that that was essential to the to the first season of that show. Right, that she's looking for her mother, and in fact, she doesn't know all the skills she has or the power she has. And when you wrote that, you were a parent, right? Versus you when you were writing some of these comedies when you were much younger. So your life experience did they also inform choices in terms of? I know you're a big mystery reader. Right. I knew you as uh, a comedy writer, and it wasn't until, you know, more recently that I started reading some of your scripts and your mystery scripts, and they were so off the charts excellent. I, I mean, I could connect that you are a reader of those and an admirer of those, but I didn't know you could make the transition into writing them so seamlessly. So it is what's going on in my life when when i was a kid i was thinking a lot about girls i was thinking about comedies i was thinking about that kind of thing and then as i had my your daughter and I thought okay i see the connection here is that what you're yes, getting yes yes i also i have loved those books since i was a young guy those kind of uh, dark mysteries and i i had the ability to write comedy comedies something that either you hear the music of or you don't so either you've been funny all your life or it's not something you can develop. That's that's one thing. Yeah, I agree with that. And like, for instance, no matter what I would do or how many piano lessons I would take, there's nothing that could make me musical, but I can hear the music of comedy, but I can't play an instrument. So um, I, uh, I, I, there's a part of myself that's always been attracted to the dark procedurals and stuff like that, and and also mystery. And I find a piece of myself in every one. And it's interesting you talk about being a, a dad. Uh, that's when I started getting into it, really. Because when you have a child, all of a sudden there's jeopardy in your life. <laughs> every day. Every day, right? <laughs> every day. And there's... there um, Because be- when you're single and even if you're married... What does it you, matter? You, you know, like you, you go on a vacation, you don't think twice... You know, but then if you went on a vacation with your kid, staying with your mom or dad or something, all of a sudden you're calling every day, you're worried. And so there's jeopardy. And so that, that, that I think really did transition when I, when I, you know, I had a daughter. Um, tell us about the, the shows that you're, that you're working on, because, um, I'm really interested in, uh, I love all three scripts, uh, Mercy Dog and Shelter and uh, Beverly Hills Noir. Um, When you approach, what's the difference when you have an original, which is Mercy Dog? Is that an original? No, no, that's based on a novel by Tyler Diltz. Oh, okay. Yeah, fantastic novel. And what I did was I made a big change in that. I changed it from a uh, a father and a son to a uh, a father and a daughter. So I changed that uh, relationship. But again, that mirrors what, uh, you know, that I have a daughter. And 
And do you think about it, you know, do you think about it from the character and developing the character first? Or how do you, I mean, if you have a, if you have a novel, you have all the plot pieces. So then it's about how is it going to work best for television? Um, and then if it's a series, you're thinking about the character arc for the whole series. But right. And sometimes a novel closes itself off and ends. Right. And, and, the, and, and you, you, a lot of times you could say, wow, if that didn't end, if that, if, if this next thing happened, you could start developing it into a series. And so you, you know, so in a, in, you know, in a novel, and a lot of times people are disappointed that things aren't exactly like the novel, but they're completely different forms. And so, for instance, it just so happens that that novel was a first person novel. So this, that means that it's right, in written the mind in first person. person. Right, right, right. So the, as soon as you say it's going to be a TV show, it can't be in first person anymore. No, right. So it, that means that you're moving to some form of third person. And that means that, but you still want to stay very close to that character. And, but uh, instead of a character thinking five or six things, you have to show those things. Mm-hmm. So th- some people get disappointed because just necessarily when you, when you move away from the first person, you're losing a lot of that voice of that, person's thinking that people are so attracted to, but there's no other way to do it. So when you get a book and you're adapting it, how do you ask yourself that question of why now? Why is this story relevant now? And the audience is going to need to know that. And then do you think about that thematically to sort of address that? Or is it a personal question you ask yourself? I ask why I am so interested in this. Mm -hmm. And then you make a, an assumption that if I'm so passionately interested in this, maybe there's something that would interest the audience. And um, that doesn't always happen, but, you, you know, and on this, um, uh, uh, the, on the Beverly Hills Noir thing that I'm doing, which is an adaptation of a James Elroy novel, mm-hmm. um, that uh, th- that really interested me because it, it takes place like one minute from my house, everything. And it's and, and it's it's just about how Beverly Hills, on the surface, is this daytime gleaming, uh, uh, you know, bastion of you know Rodeo Drive and mm-hmm. uh, and you know big cars and 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 a lot of uh, it, it's so uh, deeply seated in pop culture. Everybody has a vision of what Beverly Hills is, so right. you're able to take the environment and twist it. Yeah, and, that, it. and and it's called Beverly Hills Noir because. In fact, about eight o'clock at night, Beverly Hills is deserted. Yeah. Right. But but this is about all the underbelly of what is going on that makes Beverly Hills Beverly Hills. And uh, and you know it's very interesting. I read all these books of history about Beverly Hills, and um, it uh, it talked about going down the rabbit hole. I went down the rabbit hole of Beverly Hills, and um, it, it, it you know was founded by uh, silent film stars. Uh, who wanted to get away from the very restrictive environment of Los Angeles? Believe it or not, there used to be there used to be signs saying uh, "No Jews and No Dogs." Wow! Yeah, in in that's why est- they created Beverly Hills. Well, uh, r- real estate developers who were at first interested in finding oil developed Beverly oh, Hills, okay. and there there was no oil except for down near Beverly Hills High School. There was one oil well. Um, but then they said, oh, we could sell it as uh, real estate, uh, not recognizing that there wasn't a lot of water there. And what then what the silent film stars did when they were thinking of incorporating it all into Los, Los Angeles, they said, no, we want to keep it Beverly Hills. And they, uh, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks, found a guy who found the water for Beverly Hills. By drilling or the, the, he, or he, sh- wells and and, and uh, it was and so in a way it's kind of also the underpinnings of Chinatown. I was just going to say Chinatown. It it's always about the water. But 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 even Chinatown is really about a land grab. It's about land, right? And the, and this was about land, and so that's what th- this became about. And I I got so interested in all the, uh, you know, all, all the subterfuge that created Beverly Hills. And it takes place now, but all the same stuff is going on right now that went on back 
in the silent film days. Yeah, that's why I love the script so much. And I think uh, you have such a winner uh, in that. And doing that research, you can start to, uh, you can see how big the stakes are. And talk to me about, you know, the stakes and the obstacles that you're looking to create, especially in a mystery. You have to have a lot of red herrings. But um, how do you go about um, teasing out of the script, out of the novels, you know, what you think would be the best um, obstacles and then therefore stakes that keep escalating from episode to episode? Well, you start with the character. You mm -hmm. start with what operates with the character all the time that makes them interesting. And that usually you try to find a part of yourself. And, and of course, in, if it's in a book, it's already there. Uh, that makes them interesting, that sees the world differently or that notices things differently than you or I would. And so like the classic example is CSI, right? Um, you, you know, you or I would see a, a, a gunshot victim. It'd be really gross for us. And But in, in CSI, they say, wait a minute, they fell down in this way. And therefore, the bullet had to come from here, but there's no bullet hole there. So what could explain that? And then there's the mystery. Right. Right. And so, uh, and I think all of us are interested in what's beneath the thing that we see, yeah. that we see. And then how uh, is, and so like, for instance, uh, Alice going down the rabbit hole. Right. Right. She, uh, we, we, use, we use Alice in Wonderland terms in every writer session. It's just, it's just part of the vernacular. You just go, um, uh, uh, and this is where we're really going to go down the rabbit hole, where the detective goes down the rabbit hole, where the detective finds this really gruesome clue and then really goes down deep and, and researches that or gets into that world. And then they, we also say, what's on the other side of the looking glass? It's, you know, and this is where we see Wonderland. So in a fantasy project, for instance, you go, when this door opens, we see an entirely different dimension. Right. And, and then you have your portals into, you have all of this terminology, um, but so much of it is, it comes from, you know, a book that was written 157 years ago. It's sort of remarkable. You know, in, in current day fantasy stuff, everybody goes, oh, you know, you should, you should give J.K. Rowling, uh, you know, like 10% of your money because like, but she didn't create. Uh, the, uh, the fantasy story, you know, I mean, it, one of the original fantasy stories was, was uh, Alice in Wonderland. And that, uh, th the idea that, you know, Alice didn't know precisely who she was, which is identity. And then she went down the rabbit hole and then she, and then she encountered a uh, Wonderland and, you know, the Mad Hatter, uh, all that stuff is, are, are it's so in vernacular that we use it in writers' rooms all the time, and and what's what's interesting um, about the um, about the reference to to Alice these days is that um, you know her, his books have been adapted into one hundred and ninety seven languages, like twice Harry Potter. So if anything. She should be giving money to the Lewis Carroll estate. Exactly. So, um, well, you know, obviously I've been, you know, playing in the Alice universe for a long time, but I wanted to ask you a question about that because, you know, Alice in Wonderland, she, you know, she falls down the rabbit hole and her adventure in the book is very episodic. Um, and it's not always like she has a lot of agency, but she does have agency. She does, she she does stand up for the injustices, um, but she is trying to figure out who she is. And I, I think that that question is is universal. Who am I today? Who will I be next year? Trying to connect the dots to your to your life that leads you to the point you are now. I mean, generally, fantasy is about identity. Right. Generally, those stories are about identity. <clears throat> Even modern day ones. What's the one where uh, that where the uh, guy uh, has two parts of his life and they're completely separate, and he goes to work, and they. You you mean the with, um, the movie with Adam Scott where. Oh, Severance. Sever yeah. Severance. Oh, Ben Temple Smith. I mean Ben Temple Smith. Ben. Um, Ben, uh, ben Stiller show, right? Yes. It, yeah. it, it, we come back to Ben Stiller. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the reason why I have my house. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, if you think about it, right, uh, he 
doesn't really know who he is because part of him has been severed. Right. Right. And so that's an identity thing and that's a fantasy thing, but it doesn't look like Alice in Wonderland. It doesn't look like Shadow Hunters or it doesn't look like, you know, uh, the, the Harry Potter series. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just a powerful, powerful uh, metaphor. Um, and what I discovered with um, with Alice is not only is it so deeply seated in culture, um, it's referenced across all mediums. However, it hasn't been adapted into as many TV shows as you know as the Wizard of Oz um, because because it's episodic and and so one of the things that I was thinking about is how do you change that so that the identity part of it is is the strong that's what she's seeking but that she has a mission to go on she has to go from point A to point B um, and it's very specific and when you and I got together and put a, uh, a writer's room together to break out the non- novel to figure out the best um, strategy to turn it into a TV show. One of the things that you were quick to point out is from a casting standpoint, Alice, we want Alice as the 20 year old, as the adult Alice to follow because the young Alice, if you would if you if you if you get so invested in the young Alice and and then you do five or six episodes and then she's gone um, and you have another actress, that can be a bump with the um, with the uh, with the with the viewers. But I'm curious if you the, still the only th- time I've seen that work slightly in a modified version recently was the Queen's Gambit. I mean, that was really bold that they had the first episode with a young actress without your big star, except in the very opening of the show. Yeah, and so I wanted to ask you about that because um, because that was such a topic of our conversation uh, in the writer's room. And then I also saw The Queen's Gambit and loved it. And I, I love that we had the cold open and we see her and we don't know what's going on. And that in the pilot, we get all of that exposition and we get to know who she is and and we see her evolve into, um, into this prodigy. So... Uh, I I started to rethink the pilot for for the Looking Glass Wars and maybe having pieces of the young Alice. But then there's other shows. Now, the other thing that's happening is the fractured time and jumping from timeline to timeline without explaining it. So like in The Witcher, you're watching multiple timelines at the same time. Um, So tell me, uh, what are your thoughts on you know, the way that TV and storytelling is evolving with streamers and what we, like the rules have been changed. Right. Well, it used to be that you would define yourself either as a screenwriter or a TV writer. Exactly. I remember those days. Yes. And so, and the, and even at where I teach at the AFI, they still have screenwriting classes and they have television classes. And in fact, they have merged completely. In fact, of all work in the WGA is from some form of television. Right. Meaning the streamers and everything like that. And then big producers like Jerry Bruckheimer many years ago decided, well, this is ridiculous. A television show doesn't have to look like a television show. We can have it look like a movie and be told in the language of movies. And where it used to be that television would be a sequence, instead of sequences, it would just be scene, 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 scene. And that would define what a television show is. And now television shows, just like movies, have sequences of small, you know, rapidly moving things that have a beginning, middle and end. And um, and so there is no difference anymore between the two mediums, except for classic things like a sitcom is still exactly. written like a sitcom. And the, u- the basic unit of sitcom writing is the scene. And there's not really many sequences in sitcoms. That means where an audience is there on stage, as opposed to like Modern Family, which is a single camera comedy, which does have sequences. So your experience as a child or as a young adult with Alice in Wonderland, how did you first come to Alice? Well, probably like everyone did, you would hear these phrases that were just everyone used. And then you read the book. And so, and then what I loved 
most engaging with Alice was when you wrote The Looking Glass Wars. And it, to me, that was like what Wicked did to, uh, you know. Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz is what, is what you did, is, is a whole new look and a new point of view on that story. And for me, that got me more into Alice than the original story. Because like you said, it's very episodic and whimsical, be- beautifully written. But what I liked about The Looking Glass Wars was exactly what you were just describing, which is there is a drive to it and a, and, and a mission to the whole thing and oppositions that you've set up that are so much bigger than in the looking in in uh, the Alice in, Alice in Wonderland. You you have the, these wonderful the card soldiers and the red and everybody uh, built out so that you say to yourself, ah, oh, this is a universe and that we can traverse this universe and it's infinite because you you know the the coolest thing that we were talking about when we were doing uh, the, we're working on the series together is that you could do a flashback episode to hundreds of years before to, to the, to the, to the whole generation before Queen Red. Right. Right. And, and there, there's all that. And then, and then what's, what's to become of the split between Wonderland and the real world? Yeah. And I, I felt like that was the most unique aspect of it is uh, Wonderland coming up through the rabbit hole. But because the premise is that Lewis Carroll changed the story then that just suggests there's a real story and you can and that's infinite you can just continue to grow and so one of the things that you said when we were in the room uh, and I'm wondering if this is something you do in in every room is you created zones and I wonder if you could talk about what that means in creating zones for taking uh, a novel or a work or a world creation. What what is how how do you well, see that? First of all, every show has world creation, whether or not it's just taking place in our normal everyday lives, or it's taking place in something unbelievably fantastic like Wonderland, you know, and uh, card soldiers and all the things that you have. Um, it. It, and th- what we're talking about in zones and television is that when you're doing a series and you want that series to run a long time, you want to have different areas to go to where there's big areas of story. If you just have a single lead in a drama series, that person will burn out all the story in a couple of episodes. So as that person meets their family of the show, whether it's their real family or just the characters that they meet in the show, you want to be able, like for instance, in yours, you want to be able to cut to the, you know, to Hatter. And you want to be cut to Hatter Madigan and his whole storyline. And then you want to be able to cut to Queen Red and what's going on with her. And is is she looking for Alice? And then if she sends the cat to go look for Alice, you want to be able to follow the cat. And then you want to be able to follow Hatter Madigan's brother. And you and so then and and, and what the, the shows that people really love like Game of Thrones, if you think about it, of all those storylines, those are those are zones of story mm, that that right. that are very rich and very powerful and can 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 sustain a whole episode. So no matter which zone you're going to, the audience is going to be compelled. Um, to uh, to follow these characters and what and that's what you you have to have strong really strong like Arya Stark and the mountain yeah. or, or and yeah. you know and the guy that she's with uh, th- that and and her whole epic journey into the man with different faces and all that that all of that stuff uh, is it, are big zones of story and the, and so that you're intercutting between those and that's what makes this big tapestry so when you're World building in something complex, like um, and, and and large, like Looking Glass Wars, you want to you want to establish like all these different areas that you can go to, so that the audience is going, oh, I, oh, I want to see the conclusion of this story. Now we're going over here, and then oh my God, what's happening here? Mm-hmm. And so you yeah, you want, you want to start a lot of fires. Yeah, so I, I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about the uh, Looking Glass Wars season one a little bit differently, but because you're here and we talked about the Queen's Gambit, and I think I can get some free work out of you. Yes. Uh, what do you think about the way that they set that up and how, how is that possible for the Looking Glass Wars? Because the 
the premise of Alice meeting Lewis Carroll and seeing Lewis Carroll change her story, that's the high concept moment, which everybody can recognize as, oh, this is why this is different. This is why this, um, th- why this should exist. Um, and it's also, especially in culture now with, you know, what's real, where facts are not facts, um, you know, what's real and what's fantasy, it, 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 it feels thematically like, oh, this is an interesting spot. But you have to spend some time with her as a young girl and meeting Lewis Carroll and seeing how Lewis Carroll gets it wrong and how it affects her. Um, and that would change the idea that we started with, which was she was an unreliable narrator, which is a really cool idea because it's like, okay, what's real or not? Um, In fact, Lewis Carroll was the unreliable narrator. Exactly. So I'm wondering if you were choosing between those two, having that high concept, getting it out early versus the unreliable and trusting, okay, we can get to a flashback of the coup and Lewis Carroll writing these books. What what, what was your take today? Well, a a lot of it has to do with um, sales, right? Meaning that it and it depends who you are. Uh, the Queen's Gambit was really a risky thing to do because you had a big star. Uh, she wasn't a big star at the time, but she became a huge star, uh, Anna Taylor Joy, right? And then um, she appeared at the very beginning of it, and then we go back to her as a little girl watching her mother uh, pass away in a car, and then she goes to this orphanage. Well, yes, I I, I just thought that that was brilliant. It's extremely risky because you are that that first episode is hanging on a young actress who who is clearly not as experienced and skilled as the older actress, and you're hoping that that would be great. Now, story wise, you're absolutely right. It would be great to spend time with Alice, especially like in a first episode, and do the prequel to the whole series. In the business of television, very often. They want you to do the series and not the backstory of the series. But now the world has been opened up to different ways of telling a story. And I could see that the first episode could be, you you could go back in time. You could start with the adult Alice that is your star, very much like in uh, Queen's Gambit. And you could flash back to her young life that she barely remembers because she remembers Lewis Carroll's version of her of her story. That, that Exactly. And everybody keeps telling her that's the real story. And she's the muse to that. And, you know, the pain that c- came from that as a young girl, she she pushes away. Um, but, to, but at the age that she is, and we opened it up, I think, with her birthday, that maybe she's remembering now. Right. OK, great. So, yes, you could do it. Um, th- and Scott Frank, who wrote. The Queen's Gambit is an Academy Award-winning screenwriter. That, and, that makes a difference. Yeah, and, and he, you know, and and he's a phenomenal director, and he is the you know a a giant uh, industry person. So uh, possibly they took that chance with him, and, and or and maybe I don't know this. I don't know whether or not this is true. He might have had all the episodes written, so they might have been. It's possible that they actually sat there and said. Oh, this works. Also, uh, I believe he wrote all the episodes and he also directed all of them. Um, and so he had all of that all of that control. And as we talked about earlier, when you're in that position, you can take chances. Uh, in my position, not so much. Well, I mean, th- that's the thing. There's all the context, right? Like, uh, you know, Ryan Murphy or Shonda Rhimes can do things that uh, younger showrunners or not as uh, famous showrunners could not do. And, um, uh, I, I, you know, a lot of people um, ask why we, getting back to Mary for a second, why we did Mary, certain things in Mary in the original draft of Mary. We weren't, uh, Peter Farrelly had done uh, Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. And he was a big director. So we hadn't, we, we hadn't done that. So we did what the studio had asked us to do on certain things. Well, when Peter did it and took, and Peter and Bobby took the script, they, they were really successful. So people, um, they, you know, if, if I would have pitched, hey, I'm going to start uh, the, the, sh- the movie with a guy singing in a tree. 
<laughs> right. Right? Like right. in like this old movie Cat Baloo where there were singers going on like madrigals walking around. They they would have said what they did at Fox to Peter, which is we're cutting that out of the movie. Right. And 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 also, you know, you're talking about the prequel story when he was in high school with the braces on. That was 25 minutes of the movie. It was critical to setting up um, his character and our sympathy for him, especially when he got his junk uh, stuck in the zipper. Yes. And, and, and I said to Peter at the time, are you going to have... Ben, who's like, yeah, I think at the time he was like 32, play his high school self. And Peter just said, it'll be hilarious. And and it was. Yeah. He had the bad haircut and the yeah. braces. It was hilarious. But you if you, if he didn't have the street cred of having directed Dumb and Dumber that made a ton of money. Never would have happened. Never would have happened. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a really important point in, you know, all creations, uh, you know, we could talk a little bit about the various the books because you know I I wrote when I wrote the Looking Glass Wars, um, you know I I had an editor on me the entire time. I mean I probably had to do forty drafts, um, and and then I was really fighting for the cover art, and I had all this great concept art, and they're like, no no, you're the you, you don't make a decision on the art, but at the end of the day, the art overwhelmed the choices they came up with, so they chose mine. Um, uh, but, uh, did you have the same experience with, I mean, the great thing about writing books is they, they really want you to have the voice and, and they really want you to take over. But at the same time, there's all these publishing restraints that are not dissimilar to movie and TV restraints. Well, when you wrote the books, I got extraordinarily jealous and decided that I was going to write some books. You're so competitive. I was so competitive and, uh, in golf too. <laughs> and, and so I decided I was going to write the books. So, um, no, you said, if you can do it, anybody can do it. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I said, I said, I, I am going to, if Frank's writing books, I'm writing books. So I, 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 I wrote these books. Now I had an advantage that you didn't have at that time. When, I, when my editor was there, I had written, you know, close to a billion dollars worth of movies by that point. Right. So, so she, she was the opposite, uh, which, which is like, she would tell the copy editor, uh, he uses capitals a lot uh, because he's a screenwriter and that's the voice of the book. Don't change it. Wow. Yeah. I, I never would have had that. Yeah. So, right. so you know, because I, in, in my book, the, the, the character's a guy like me who's very hyperbolic. So he constantly says things in capital letters. And, and, and that's from screenwriting too. You use yeah. capital letters when you introduce something. So, so, uh, so th- we, we kept that in the books. But but nevertheless, it's context, right? So um, Shonda can do what Sh- if 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 anyone if anyone else said I'm going to have uh, a, a show about the British royalty and a whole bunch of people are going to be black, you, you would and, and you would go and with I with very minimal uh, explanation with, with very minimal historical. Connection. I mean, there's some. I read some things that there were some people that had like Moorish, uh, uh, you know, things in the court or something. But and just and, and you, they would say uh, no. But Shonda did it. Of course, it was super successful and super great. But she, uh, she, she had that the context, the correct context, uh, her success. You know what I mean? In the same way, if I said, I'm going to, I think I'm going to make a movie about my love of movies as a young boy and how I became to love movies, they would go, yeah, that's great. Uh, (laughs) That's great. Why don't you leave now? And when Steven Spielberg says it, everybody says it is. Whatever you want. Yeah, And And and, and also with uh, James Cameron movie coming out, the uh, sequel, it's three and a half hours. It's like, uh, no, Frank, you can't make a three and a half hour movie. Exactly. And, and, but, but. but, For for $400 million. But, but I, but. But Steven Spielberg is a very responsible producer as well. He didn't spend two hundred eighty million dollars making Fablemans. Right. He made it for the correct price for that movie. And like somebody like Clint Eastwood does the same thing. He doesn't spend two hundred fifty million dollars making a movie. Clint Eastwood. Right. No, he does not. He, he does not. That's... And so he's he 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 understands that this is how much this movie should cost. Avatar is an open checkbook movie. That's what we call it. Yeah. Where it's just infinite. And we will see what happens. I read a few very good reviews yes. today, so maybe he'll pull it off. They were saying, but talk about Wonderland, right? Yeah. Talk about Wonderland. You got a guy. He's got, um, it, it, you know, if if you break Avatar down, 
you've got a guy who's got no, you know, no use of his legs. And so we're, we're empathetic to him. You say, oh no, you know, th- th- I hope that never happens to me or, you know, or that's th- that, you know, too bad for him that that happened. And then they say to him, hey, your brother uh, is missing, but uh, it, you could go up to this planet and guess what? You could be 70 times more agile than any human being. Uh, go, and, and he's like, hell yeah. Yeah. I'm going to do that. Yeah. I'll, I, I, I'm sure there's other dangers and some... But I have my legs. And some animals and everything. But, I, <laughs> but I, I, I'm doing that. I, I, I'm a soldier and I want to do that. And that's basically the going down the rabbit hole. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's, that is Alice down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I mean, down the rabbit hole is almost its own genre. Yes. I mean, it's, it is a genre. It's a trope that we know that, as you point out in this movie, that's what it is. It's going up to space, up a rabbit hole, but it's still a genre. It, it's, it's, it's a genre. I mean, meaning like close encounters. Uh, I'm seeing things in the sky. I think there's, I think there's uh, extraterrestrials. I, I, what's going on? And then at the very last moment, we're up in a spaceship in Wonderland, right? And then as as soon as you get to that planet, um, fr- you know, in Avatar, you you go from, uh, yeah, you know, the world we know, in, in quotes, we, in the spaceship, we've been there. A million times. A million but... times. We've been in a spaceship a million times, and we've been in that kind of suspended animation in a million series, and we do, we know that. And that's that's kind of ground zero. That's our world, so to speak. And then he he goes into this tube, and he comes out as a big blue creature uh, running around on the top of trees and jumping 500 feet down in, you know, onto leaves. And it's absolutely magical. And it's a, it's a fantasy land that feels real and feels as if you could go there. And so you completely suspend disbelief, which is the magic of storytelling and certainly about fantasies. And so, um, you know, one of the things I used to do in school visits is I used to tell the story to kids and, and then I would give them directions to whatever local freeway they are to go visit Wonderland themselves, to make it as real and as possible and fantastical as, and, and that's what we want. We want that escapism from what's going in our own lives. So, Right. Um, are there other references to Alice in Wonderland and pop culture that uh, you identify with or that you have put together recently? Um, um, you know, for me, it was it, it really obvious. Uh, I've said this before. It's uh, in The Matrix. But, um, you know, even in, um, you know, in The Matrix, it was... It was imagery they used so much, but in Jurassic Park, the one of the the hackers, I think the code was down the rabbit hole, right? Um, and so there's. I mean, I, I see it in in so much in everything. Television and Stranger Things. I just saw it. it it's it's everywhere. But by, by the way, I mean, it, it's this is the paradigm. Monsters Inc. Right? Okay, mm-hmm. so it's a completely animated movie. Right. So in a way, it's uh, it's you know, but it's a it's in our world, right? It's little kids getting scared by monsters, and uh, and you know, and that's our kind of you know uh, ground zero, our home base, right? And that's the the buy of the movie. But then there's this whole sequence where uh, they're in, in with all the doors, you right? All the all the doors traveling in space. That's Wonderland. Yeah. Exactly. Right? That's that's you're transported into that's another world. Narnia. That's every fantasy, right? Every There's fantasy. Just some door that you open, whatever that, whatever the mechanic is, the key, what have you. Right. So the Looking Glass. That's the door, right? And so you, you it just um, has be. It's so in the fabric of what we uh, in writers do every day. So what about? Um, uh, I just wanted to touch on female characters because when i first started in hollywood there were no there were not that many uh movies or action movies or fantasies where there was a female protagonist it was like oh we need a male star that whole paradigm has caught up to the stories that i was that i've always been interested there's something about mary wicked was a teenage girl um, the Juliet, which you know is a project that I've worked on for years, which I've loved, loved, loved. I've worked on that for more than I want to admit. And then, of course, Alice. 
Um, so there's been a paradigm shift shift in terms of the 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 you know the female lead. I wonder um, how many stories have you been creating with female leads and and almost all of them. Yeah, but be, it, it, again, it it there's uh, not only is it more interesting because there's just. Um, uh, more stakes because uh, not because uh, females aren't smart and powerful. It's because uh, they are preyed upon or, or, uh, or uh, underestimated, be- underestimated and belittled uh, so much less than men. So that, that, that makes the, the hero's journey even greater. And so, you know, and you know, as, as funny as Ben Stiller was in, in Mary, it would not work. Uh, the, the whole thing wouldn't work if Mary wasn't a great character. And she was, you know, she was smart. She was athletic. She uh, was empathetic. Um, you know, and, and I think, um, you know, from my working on the Looking Glass Wars, I just wanted to change the paradigm of the time. So instead of a kingdom, I turned it into a queendom. I can't tell you how many mistakes people make uh, when they write about the book and they say it's a kingdom. I I'm constantly going, no, it's a queendom. The women are empowered. The men follow. The men characters are cool because they have all the gadgets, but it's a female-driven society. Right. uh, And they're the ones who lead. Um, But now, you know, I I think that uh, finally culture is caught up with the 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 power of women in leadership roles. And it's really fun to write, um, to your point, and to flip the, you know, the expectation. So Right. I mean, in this one that I'm working on called Mercy Dogs, uh, you know, based on this great novel by Tyler Dilt, I um uh, I flipped it to a female character and it's a it's a woman who was a homicide detective who gets shot. And then she, about a year later, is recovering from this really tough injury. And she there's a big hole in her memory, not just around the shooting, but around a lot of things. And her behavior is very erratic. She's taking all these drugs and medications. And she's retired now. And no one trusts her. She makes a lot of phone calls like, paranoid phone calls that there's people invading the house when there's no one there and she's just grappling to get her sanity back and then the woman who rents a room at her house goes missing and no one believes her oh, so such a great unreliable narrator yeah it's so the That's worst fantastic. narrator ever and wow. everyone she encounters is sort of vaguely afraid of her because they've seen her ranting about things and they saw how crazy she was and she was shot. And, you know, the uh, the implication is they almost are twirling their fingers around. Yeah, nutty. That, nutty. that, that she's nutty, you know. And and um, she knows, she knows that this, that someone's gone, but she is so relieved to see a couple of things on video that confirm that there was a car in an alley behind her house because she doesn't know if she saw that car or she didn't. And so she's so relieved that her neighbors have a ring doorbell that that saw this thing. And I think that that's so, so incredibly interesting because you, you like if you if I go to a car dealership with my wife and my wife is much smarter than I am. And but the but the the car guy will always talk to me. Right. Mm-hmm. right. Talk to me. And it's like. She's much smarter. I'd rather you talk to her. Right. You know, and so. And they're reluctant. They're reluctant. Like yeah, a double take. Yeah, like the little woman. You know, it's yeah. just it, it's still out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, what um, if you were to uh, if you were to reimagine a classic um, for television? You know, like how many times have they done Sherlock Holmes? I mean, it, it's amazing. I mean, they just had season two of Enola Holmes, and it did fantastic. Yeah. My daughter loves that show. Yeah. Um, is there, you know, is there one out there? I mean, do you, could you do Treasure Island or, you know, what, uh, anything come to mind in terms of, you know, something that you read as a kid that you'd be interested in reimagining? No, I mean, one, one of my favorite books was to, to jump over, not letting you answer, was the Phantom Tollbooth. Not that that's, you know, a classic, but it's a classic 
from my standpoint, in terms of, you know, this is a toll booth that sends him on the adventure. You, you know, the first thing that pops to mind is a kid's book that I loved when I was a kid, and it goes right to what the work I'm doing now. When I was a kid, I loved these Encyclopedia Brown books. Mm. And okay, it sure. was it was a kid detective, and he just would he just was real knowledgeable about science and all this kind of stuff, and he'd figure things out. And there and, and it was literally the trigger, the the <clears throat> gateway drug for all these novels that I read now and all the work I'm doing now. <laughs> and uh that I would remake with a woman, uh, a woman detective. Well, is there is there you know, a way for us to contextual, contextualize this whole conversation with what is it about Alice that resonates with culture as a iconic character, as a fantasy book, the, 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 the feeling of wanting to escape, uh, to f- having an identity. Cause Alice kind of rebels, right? She does. Yeah. And, and, uh, and th- that is, deep in the genes, right, to want to rebel against authority. And then the other thing is, is that the idea that, you know, everyone feels in some way that their life is kind of humdrum or mundane. Mm-hmm. Uh, e- even people whose lives are not humdrum and mundane, to, to them it's their their lives. And there is this sense that what if there was something else, like another dimension right. or something that w- where a whole world opens up? And, um, you know, I, I, the, uh, the, the same guy who said uh, television is, uh, is a government and, and, and movies are war said that uh, when you have a child, it's like an undiscovered country of love. Mm. And, and uh, you hear a lot of uh, like um, – uh, even John Mayer sings that song, uh, Wonderland, right? Uh, mm, yeah. And oh, there's so much music that's influenced it, by Alice. It's, it's it's unbelievable. It just doesn't stop. Right? Yeah. And um, you know, and so the the, the idea that um, the idea that beyond the humdrum life that we have is there this other world that that is just interesting and fascinating and beautiful and with populated with different, you know, amazing characters and everybody has those fantasies. Yeah, it's so true. So to wrap this up, let me just ask, um, what is the most uh, requested piece of advice as a teacher? You know, you teach at AFI. So what do you think inspires the, the students and uh, where do you think they're, they, what, what do you think they mo- most well, often ask? They, they most often ask this, how do I write something successful? Right. And which is not the right question. The right question Clearly. is, how, how do I write something that's personal to me that- Can connect. Can connect. And I call it the bridge, right? Mm-hmm. How do I build a bridge? Be- and, and that is really the core of Alice, right? Is that there's this girl and we sort of understand her life and we see- her and then she goes into this other world and we go along with her and it's a bridge to another world and so if you if you as a writer um can can build that bridge and bring people along on a journey that's what leads to success but it comes from you and it comes from the character and not uh, there are a lot of people who think i'm going to create a world and then stick a character in yeah it. that does not work that does not work and and it, it's a, a, you and world creation is following a character and then discovering a world. And if you and I were musical, we would take that phrase "a bridge to another world" and we would write a hit song. Yes, but we're not. So I'm going to have to live in the fantasy of writing a hit song. Yes, as a fantasy of being a big rock star. Ed Dector, thank you so much. I'm sure our listeners will really appreciate the insight into the business of writing and showbiz. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have uh, to chat with you. Thank you. <laughs>